Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for this live discussion. Uh, today, we have a special guest. His name is Oshri Hakak. He's an author, an artist, and a musician based in Los Angeles, California, and he creates to uplift. He especially love, loves creating illustrated books about unconventional topics for both children and grownups to help people live more adaptive and happy lives. His books can be found on butterflyonbooks.com and Amazon, and we'll link those below for you. My name is Nicole Lamberson. I was trained as a physician assistant, and I volunteer doing outreach for the film Medicating Normal, and I'm going to host the conversation with Oshri today. So hi, Oshri. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me here. Yeah, sure. So I guess to start, I want to talk about uh, the film. You watched our movie last night, and I wonder mm -hmm. if you have any thoughts about it or how it sort of relates to um, some of the work that you've been doing. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you for being a part of making the film. It was really powerful. And um I mean, it touched on a lot of, it touched me in a very personal way. Um, I think we had talked about it before. Uh, um, I have a older brother who passed away from heart complications about eight years ago, but he had been really um, kind of on the gamut of prescription meds and then self-medicating with marijuana alongside that for many years. and. Um, when we had even asked at some point, we had asked his psychiatrist, like, do you have, not what a diagnosis was, but do you have a diagnosis? And he said, no. So had he not passed away and there was capacity for more presence, maybe there would have been some like legal action, but you know, his family member passes and really you're just kind of in shock. But it was, um, you know, coming back that really, the, the stories that the documentary covered were very personal and, and very different too. I mean, you had um, you had military and former military and you had a woman coming out of high school and a professional woman in New York. And I mean, it was just such a great cross section of many lives and demographics and um, I found it really educational too. I didn't, I hadn't known about really the history of how pharmaceuticals had come on stage and also how they had intersected with um, with psychology and then psychiatry. And um, that was yeah, eye opening. So I really appreciate you having the documentary out there just for public knowledge and then also. Um, this person, it was very personally validating too. Yeah. I thought maybe it would be something that you would appreciate just from reading some of your books and the work you do, because it seemed like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but just reading some of your stuff and we'll get into, into your books and we're even going to have you read one today. But it seems like that you sort of want to encourage people to really examine and explore their emotions and even normalize them instead of pathologizing them. Is that fair? Very yeah. fair. Yeah, yeah. I so, couldn't have said it better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I guess I kind of want to know, like, what brought you to that place uh, of wanting people to examine and not pathologize emotions um you know especially people of all ages and then to want to to write a book about them for all these different topics yeah I, I love to speak to that and let me know if I skip over any element of that because my mind goes is going okay. to a few places cool yeah. um well yeah I, I think I think it's all very personal um I I started doing a daily drawing um, about 10, no, it's been more than 10 years uh, that I've been doing a drawing every day, um, mm -hmm. kind of as my own self-therapy and also 
you know, I started in my middle twenties when I wasn't all I was sure of at that point in career was that I loved making art and I wanted to find something that I could do um, that was like bare minimum that even on my laziest of days, I would still make something. So I started doing these daily drawings with word art and um, now it's been like almost 4,000 days I've been doing this and it's been a self therapy. Mm-hmm. And then I've begun to see like where it resonates with people um, too. So it's, um, I found it helpful to look at my own inner world to see what's going on and then kind of see, oh, other people, it's actually not just me. Maybe I'm making a piece of art or representing it in some way, but this is actually um, collective experience. And, um, and I've been lucky to be able to take some time to process that. Uh, but it's it's not just me, you know, I'm not owning other people's stuff, but it's just how it is. We all have such a complex range of emotions and experience. Um, and, you know, the first couple of years of focusing on art, I really, um, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do with it. And, um, you know, I was trying to get into the gallery space and there was a, there was an agent who I paid for a couple months, a really nice person, but after a couple months, she said, you know, your art is too happy for the art world. Um, like it was, I was like, oh, okay. Um, well, thanks for letting me know. You know, yeah. so I kind of feel like, but I did feel kind of disillusioned with what the gallery space, or at least my experience of the gallery space was, but I knew I wanted to keep creating. And During this daily artwork, what came clear was that, um, well, really like children's books and illustrated books were Mm -hmm. such, um, they had the most intrinsic value to me at the time because it's like, well, I don't really care. And like, even if a couple people read it, it just feels so good to have, um, I look at it as very sacred because when you write a children's book, you're kind of entering into a family dynamic because often these are read before bedtime Mm -hmm. for kids Um, and it's you're kind of curating an experience for kids and parents now some of the stuff I write is probably not like the stay alive book it's probably not for that context but there's still this level of like intimacy I like to keep like how someone is taking time to resonate with your words and sometimes my images, sometimes other uh, images of other artists I work with. And um, I just, I get juiced honestly by it. Like I I love um, ideating new children's books and my challenge has been getting them out there because I can can make them pretty. I mean, just, I I do it a lot, you know, whatever, whatever, like some people like them or not, but I feel a lot of motivation to um, continue to produce them and I see the need. So that's where a very very personal thing in me meets like mental health needs in the world. Um, So there's a long answer. I don't know if I touched on some of your yeah, but I guess why why the pull or the draw towards mental health and like normalizing mm. emotions and oh yeah that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, if I if I look at I've been mean, drawing my whole life and making art my whole life, but if I look at when I started to uh, make it a practice of drawing every day, I was processing while I was in my middle middle twenties. And I mean, the first few months of this, actually, I started, um, I lost a lot of weight in, in a healthy way. I lost like 80 pounds of extra weight. It was wow. like a couple suitcases or something that I was carrying around. And I really experienced how, um, and it wasn't like a ton of exercise. There was some yoga practice, deep breathing and being more aware of what I was putting in my body it was a big part of that. And um, and I saw that I could make a choice when I was looking at actually like a, what I would call addictive eating patterns. I was looking at, a, I became more aware of a choice point where I could 
go have nachos or I could like, um, I could draw something mm -hmm. and make something. But the energy had to go somewhere. It wasn't right. like, or, or it was gonna, you know, and the habit was, it was adding up on me. It was, I was consuming it and keeping it. But I found that there was other ways to navigate when I could bring awareness to my breath and then um, use the behavioral point as actually a point of choice. And it took honestly a couple of years to like start to be able to navigate that. And I also started practicing a lot more music around that time. So I really experienced um, that a lot of these difficult emotions were just bottled up. I would say, and I wasn't, um, I wasn't trained with, um, my, my, I love my parents and they, I, I, they did an amazing job and I had a, like a wonderful childhood in a lot of ways. Um, and, um, and I, I feel really privileged, honestly, and, and lucky and our culture doesn't really train like how to how do you deal with grief? How do you deal with anger, shame, sadness? And so um I don't think I'm the only one in in like my you know friend circle and cohort that's like, hmm, I got to my 30s and I'm I'm starting to get better at emotions, <laughs> you know, and, and certain ones. And and so I would say it was my middle 20s that I started to work with that and see how important it was um, to be able to navigate those things so they didn't pile up and accumulate. Um, if that speaks closer to the question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe sometimes I think all of us probably had parents that didn't teach us, you know, a lot about emotions or how to process them. And I think that's pretty common, especially in today's society you know uh yeah. but I was just thinking about art in general and finding it as something that can sort of help you process things or even just be like a good distraction uh I remember when I was in severe severe psychiatric drug withdrawal and mm -hmm. I was in a very inappropriate place for that in a detox center where I shouldn't have been sort of ripped off the medication but I was there nonetheless and one of the only, I guess, beneficial things that they sort of offered in that place was an art therapist who came mm. in. And I remember just being in this horrible, horrible withdrawal and being able to like color and create something was like a good enough distraction for my brain for the time that I was doing it, where I could sort of escape the symptoms, you know? So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then when I came home and was in terrible, terrible withdrawal, I bought these like giant coloring books for kids wow. and would just, wow. you know, color because it was like one of the only things I could do in such an extreme, extreme state, um, yeah. you know, to be able to, to cope with the symptoms. So very different mm -hmm. ways that the two of us were using art, but still in a way, you know, to be able to, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And I see a lot of similarity in, in that. Um and I think it's great that I'm glad that they had at least that resource available because uh I found it very healing. And uh one thing I'll say too is it's like we we do have I mean everyone made art when we were kids, at, at least, right? We were we all were encouraged to do that. And uh I love I love encouraging people to, there's, there, there is sometimes a barrier for uh, adults to um, create and they kind of like cut off that part or they say they aren't good. Um, yeah. So I just feel called to throw out like a suggestion for someone who thinks, well, maybe that could be helpful, but I'm not very good. Or I don't like what I make. But, uh, I mean, it was probably, so I've been, this has been like a 10 year practice of drawing every day. And, and I thought I was a decent uh, like decent at drawing and art before, but it took me like four years of doing it every day to like not be like scared of sharing it. <laughs> like, like it took, you know, that's like over a thousand or whatever that is of like daily. But what, what I could eventually sink into is like, um, this has value because I've put my life energy and time into making it. 
Yeah. It's really like that is why it has value. It's it's not, I don't know what like perfection would look like. Um, but there's value in the actual act of creating and um to practice that mm-hmm. on a regular basis is really um really healing and gratifying. Yeah. So I'm wondering, are all of your books illustrated by you or do you have other illustrators as well? Yeah, uh, it's mixed. So I have um, most of them that are out right now. um, I have illustrated, but then there are some newer ones that um, a woman named Andrea uh, Garcia in Spain has illustrated really wonderfully. And um, and I find it kind of mixed. I, I find the process really fun to write something or co-author something and then feel into, well, is this for my world of drawings? Or if, I mean, that's actually one really awesome use of social media these days is like we can look at all these artists' work and, and then say, hmm, maybe this person would be a good fit. And so I had been following Andrea's work for a couple of years and really loved it. And then I had this stay alive project and reached out and she resonated and it was, and then she did that for two other books too. It was was really incredible, honestly. Um, So it's mixed. Yeah. Okay. So stay alive was the first uh, book of yours that I came across and read. And I thought to invite you to come today because I think it's really a a good book for people who follow our channel and who are in this community. A lot of people, like you saw in the film when you watched it, when they are taking psychiatric medication, they can have, you know, an adverse effect of feeling suicidal or when they're, you know, coming off of psychiatric medications, uh, usually too quickly because they didn't know any better or their doctor didn't know any better, they can feel suicidal as a withdrawal symptom or sometimes people are just suicidal sort of not actively but because in a very normal way I think when you're suffering your ass off you don't really want to be here anymore it's horrible it sucks and you want it to end and the reality of it is with withdrawal is sometimes it lasts a really long time. And so you know that, you know, it's not going to end maybe anytime soon. And so your natural sort of like feeling is that you just don't want to be here anymore, even if you're not really actively suicidal or going to act on it. You know, there were many yeah. days in my withdrawal where I was like, I just want to die, even though I really wanted to live. I wanted to be yeah. here, you know, but I wanted yeah. the suffering to stop. So when I read Stay Alive, I thought, oh, what a perfect thing for maybe someone who's following our channel to hear today. So I want you to read the book for anybody um, watching. But before we do that, I just want to ask when you created it, what was, you know, the motivation for yeah. creating it and sort of who do you want the audience to be? Yeah. So I'll share, I remember like the moment of inception was I was going through a very difficult experience and dark, um, inner time in, uh, and I was in Northern Europe and I was, um, walking along the beach there at, late at night, which is very safe there. <laughs> like yeah. uh, very safe beaches and Scandinavia, my experience. And I was feeling so low. And then I had this thought, kind of like an intrusive thought of like, oh, I should just write a book. Like, cause I, you know, I was thinking about books and I was thinking about feeling really dark. But I wasn't necessarily, they were kind of just percolating naturally. I wasn't really walking with much intention. And then this intrusive thought comes, oh, I, should, I should write a book called Don't Kill Yourself. And, and it made me laugh, actually. I made, un, unintentionally, I made myself laugh. Yeah. And, and it's like this moment of like lightness. I was like, hmm, okay, if I can laugh, that's good. And then I think within a couple of days of that, I spoke to a, a friend of mine, a dear friend, and he said, um, 
I, and I mentioned, you know, on a whim that, yeah, I, I even had this idea more as a joke that it was funny that I had this idea. Yeah. And then he said, well, you should actually do that. Because, you know, when, when I was in high school, I had a lot of suicidal ideation, he said, and I wasn't aware of that at all. So, I, so okay, I'll do it. And um, I ended up changing the name just to yeah. like soften things a bit. Um, yeah. But, um, and then, uh, yeah, kind of the words kind of flowed through pretty naturally. And um, I, like I said, I reached out to Andrea and it's really been in the last few, and then the last, well, the last couple of years, I've had like three or four people, no one very, very everyday close, but people who are close in my orbit and their lives, mm -hmm. which at least for me has not been a normal thing. Like the last two years, like three or four um, younger people. And um and I've just been feeling like this impetus, like maybe I, maybe this book is supposed to be part of the like collective conscious discussion. The elements that came into making it, like I never would have chose them. <laughs> like I never would have chosen to feel those things. Um, but, and on the other, on the other hand, there's been like this design to it where words came through that were able to move a, a, an incredible artist and um and there's been people who really resonate and it's been a little bit up and down of feeling like wow I'm really glad this is helpful and wow I'm so sad that this seems to be a need so yeah there's a little yeah. of the backstory yeah when you said it, it you we're thinking of calling it don't kill yourself. Like I got chills a little bit because one of the people that I credit with saving my life is a journalist named Matt Samet. And he wrote an article about uh, how psychiatric drugs adversely affected him. And he went through this horrible withdrawal and I came across the article and that's how I figured out that my psychiatric drugs were causing me problems Anyways, it all came full circle years and years later. And I consider Matt now a friend and I was interviewing him recently and he is, you know, through the worst of his withdrawal and doing much better and back to living his life. And I said, you know, do you have any advice for people watching this who are at the very beginning of their withdrawal and they're just suffering, suffering horrible? And he said, don't kill yourself. That was the main advice that he had essentially for yeah yeah anybody watching so that's interesting and yeah you, know, you say that i'll reflect i was talking with the therapist a couple of days ago and i was sharing that story with her and she writes about um bi bibliotherapy and like using books as part of therapy and she was talking she said oh actually like maybe you should make that book too because like yeah. some of or she's like some of my adult clients might would really like could really potentially use that and it might need some of that element of darker humor to touch them yeah um so I'm thinking about that and for that I might need like a pen name because I, I normally write about like you know I have to think about if I'm making material for adults and children and and I want to make sure the right things go to appropriate audiences. Yeah, but, right yeah I mean, that's that's a powerful story that, I mean, just that bit of advice can actually be exactly what we need sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess since we've had this sort of intro discussion about uh, Stay Alive, would you like to share your screen and read it for folks? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me uh, make you the host so that you can do that. Okay, we'll go ahead and start sharing. Okay. I'll share the cover first, actually. Can you see it okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. So there's the cover, Stay Alive. And that is, yeah, I didn't ask her to do something that looks like me, but she did. <laughs> and I think it's pretty cute. Yeah. Oh. 
and then I'll just go ahead and start with the book. Okay. So stay alive. To anyone who doesn't feel like being here now, stay alive because flowers and because sunshine. And also mountains and the beach. Plus animals. Mm -hmm. Friends and hugs too. Hugs and friends. Yet unmet. At least one or two wait ahead, I bet. Great conversations still wait you ahead with guidance to hear and guidance to share. Also sitting. There's also the wonderful release of going pee probably. So even if you're not feeling so lively, Stay alive. Eventually the pain might fit on a shelf, maybe near the tea or the cookie elf. And if you don't have a shelf, maybe one day you will. For now, you can put it in a pocket or a pouch next to some cool rocks or leaves, even while your heart heals and breathes. I almost forgot you have some breaths and heartbeats too. These can help to steer you through. And when it looks like your options are fewer than two, you may find new ways through that you never knew you knew. You've got breaths to come that can open worlds of possibility and release the stuff that's yucky and goopy. Some heartbeats that can fuel the planting of new gardens and great forests of wonder and love, or forests of actual trees. And music, you might make some or listen, they're equally important. So stay with us. Because if you study the weather, you'll notice no storm lasts forever. And things get better. So feel what you feel as a tree feels a drought for rain, or as the moon feels the darkness of its monthly wane. Whoever you are and wherever you are, know that you are loved. You're precious to me. I'm here for you. I love you. The bend. I love it. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for reading it and sharing it. Now, I, I'm curious, what is the bend? I know you you end a lot of your books with that. So tell me. Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking sometimes a bending is better than an ending. 
Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it's, uh, and sometimes in some of them, there's a mending. So it could be the mend or the bend or the end. Yeah. But um, yeah, I and I think it ties in really to, you know, talking about people having an impulse or maybe something deeper, a sensation of, of ending their lives too. But the question is like, can maybe maybe some part of it ends and maybe it's actually a bend. Yeah. And and I think that's really I wanted to like if I saw the best use of this book in my mind's eye, it's like someone who maybe they can turn an end into a bend. Perfect. Yeah, as you were reading it, I noticed something else that I didn't notice the first time around. Um, mm-hmm. There's a syndrome in that affects some people coming off of psych meds and taking them called akathisia. It's a very mm-hmm. painful movement disorder. People mm-hmm. feel like they cannot stop moving. It's like this frantic, you know, horrible, horrible thing. And it's very high risk for suicide if people have it. Wow. And the part I had, I have a good friend. I had it. I have a good friend who had had it and he talks about it a lot and he's recovered from it now. Wow. And he says like, life is great because I can sit, you know, and that you had put sitting in your book, you know, just something yeah. so simple that people take for granted. But if you're in that horrible state where you cannot sit or stop moving, like, oh, how wondrous. Wow sitting again would be wow. yeah and I didn't even to be honest I didn't even know about that condition but I'm I'm so glad it has resonance to for people who have experienced that that sounds so horrible yeah and just so many other things I mean as you were reading it like it's hard not to get emotional because if you've been in a place where like I explained I yeah. was and so many other people were and you you know Part of, uh, for me anyways, like coping with it was future oriented fantasy or like thinking of things that I wanted to do later, or even just something so simple, you know, the future oriented fantasy, like I can't wait to go to the beach again, you know, that kind of thinking, but also things like animals, you know, the dogs that I've been around as I've been healing have been so Mm. like just nurturing for my soul as I was suffering. So I think it's so, you know, just spot on that you included animals in the book Mm. as well. Well, Yeah. 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 And there's, um, there's actually even, um, there's a line that came through a few months ago that wasn't in the original that I added. It was after talking with a, a friend whose son uh, took his life last year at 16. And um, I, yeah, I mean, you really have to numb out if you're going to have a conversation about it, because it's like even that. It's like, but um, yeah, it was like after, right after the conversation, um, it was like this line came to my head and it was like his contribution. I'm like, Oh, I better put that in the book. So, and that was the line about, um, this is what my friend had said was, you know, it was just, it was quite raw. It was just a couple months after and she said, why was this the only option? Like, why is this his only option? And, there hadn't really been warning signs. There wasn't a no. Why was this? Just he woke up and decided to do this. And um, and the line that came through was was about even though let's see when you feel like your options are fewer than two, mm-hmm. you may find new ways through. You never knew you knew, and I think that just trying to find that that bending moment you know we're like maybe hold off yeah I love that that line and also humor I noticed was just you know in there it's such a dark you know painful topic and yet you were still able you know the dog peeing and you know the elf on the shelf and uh I found too that even 
in my suffering and with friends of mine who were suffering so badly together, we could laugh sometimes even about yes. how, just how fucked up this situation is, you know, we would laugh yeah. about it. And so I think that that's such an integral part of staying alive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And I think it's because when you're not feeling that light of joy at all, it's like, it's hard to know it's hard to remember it's even there or or that even ever was. And um, well, there's a story around that, like a a quick story I love to share about. um, Yeah, it was my college music teacher, really really an awesome person. And he, and he's still with us, thankfully. But he, I remember coming in, um, I'm 36 now, this was when I was like 19. I come into his studio one day for a lesson. Obviously, I remember this for, you know, it was like such a, it made such an impression. Mm-hmm. Come in for a lesson, first time in his studio since he had his, his prostate removed. And that's all I know coming in. Yeah. And he was, he was, he was he is, uh, Southern, so he has that. It was a bit of a Southern draw. And, uh, yeah. He goes, uh, he looks at me and he goes, oh, Shri, I'm re-experiencing the joys of infancy, a warm yeah. bed and a dry diaper. <laughs> yeah. He goes, every time I play a high C, I squirt. <laughs> and, <laughs> and for me, I'm just standing there like, what? Like, yeah. He's able to access, you know, I don't think I, I hardly know anyone who would be able to access that joy when they just found out like one of their base biological functions was compromised right and the way he was able to bring laughter and humor to it was like i mean it, it kind of like drilled itself into my brain as like oh that's an option yeah and it was really so i think like there's a need in place for for dark humor sometimes or the humor to arise out of you know it's like well nothing is great but I like going pee, you know, yeah. I think in the way back of the book, I, I think I mentioned something I'm like, I hope it wasn't too hot, but I mentioned something about like, yeah, um, like picking your nose is also, it's also like enjoyable, like even yeah. that time, to pick, you know, just um, like some, whatever releases a little bit of serotonin to move through that moment, that's going to come from the natural activities of life, you know, yeah. and there are a lot of them. Yeah. And just sort of drawing attention to, to like, there's little tiny things that maybe we took for granted or didn't even think about that, you know, we still can do or have, or that bring us some kind of relief or joy or pleasure or something, you know, that uh, maybe people don't realize how great they are until they're taken away, even momentarily, like having your pee messed up because you had this surgery you know yeah Yeah. absolutely yeah Yeah. Yeah. um so I want to move into some of the other books because I want to get a chance to talk about some of the other ones that you've written so people know you know more of what's in your library as well um I guess you you sent me drawings which is this one Mm-hmm. And it says it's a illustrated guide to working with our feelings by remembering to breathe and using our creativity. Um, and it said your background in arts and yoga guided the creation of this short book. Um, and it's a powerful outlet for some of our most challenging feelings in a culture that increasingly suppresses people's feelings until they burst out in unhealthy ways, drawings empowers children and adults to take a step back, breathe, and find a creative way to sublimate their pent up negative emotions in creative and productive ways. That's and, one of the reviews, I think. Oh yeah, that somebody yeah. wrote, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then they said, if you can breathe and get through, being mad, sad, or scared, you can get to a place of calm and happiness. So is this meant to be like a coloring book for kids or? So uh, originally yeah. I made it really like the drawings very simple because 
I like didn't want it to intimidate. You know, I wanted to invite people to draw and I like, well, just simple line drawings. But it, I don't know. I think like every time I see the kid with it, they, they'll color in it. So I'm like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. It's like, kind of like they can't resist. And I think that's really fun and cool. Yeah. And so really you wanted, I guess, like you were talking about most books for kids are sort of read by their parents or read at night before bed. And the book sort of encourages kids that, you know, with drawings and, you know, they can deal with difficult emotions, but why did you call it draw, draw wings? With yeah, the the, yeah. So one of my daily drawings, like uh, four years ago or so, it was just that it was this guy with wings and mm-hmm like pencil paper wings right um and then one of my dear friends who's also a children's author and and, oh and I wrote draw wings so I just love I just think of puns a lot I'm like yeah dad jokes guy so uh my friend sees the image and he says oh that could be a whole book and I'm like oh yeah you're right it could be and so that was the impetus I made made my book out of that Yeah. Yeah. It's so important, especially in, I think our society now where like so many children are being drugged and put on medications and like normal things that they're feeling are being pathologized, you know, and so a book teaching the kids and their families that, you know, there's other ways to sort of cope. To elevate. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah, to cope, elevate. And so that, yeah, the wings, it's like, it's, I mean, it's not only a pun, but it's really, um, you know, usually if someone says I'm, I'm high or I'm getting high, like they're associated with a drug or, you know, sometimes kind of external substance, but there's so many ways to connect with our joy and feel uplifted and elevated that aren't related to drugs. Um, and um so yeah it's like you can get really you can lift up your mood they can you're you're making art can be like wings you know when you're at the uh, facility and that was like the only helpful thing there um that was like kind of like wings you know it, it kind of was a pickup and it had nothing to do with um with taking any any other substance it was just using you know your body and senses and creating yeah was there any sense as you were writing these books for people that you know you wanted to uh, like sort of offer alternatives to the current mental health paradigm yeah I think um well I think it's just been a big theme of my life honestly because when um I've been pretty um like I think having witnessed what happened with my brother, like, since I was an early teenager, I was pretty drawn on like not attracted to drugs and alcohol and kind of stigmatized it for me, which maybe it was for the best, you know, but it was, you know, like over time, I'm like, okay, some people can have something sometimes in it and I don't have to like get freaked out uh, because it was so traumatic seeing what his different uses of different substances. So honestly, I was pretty pulled away from yeah. that. Um, and so, I, but I think I had like a lot of stuff going on in me too. So I literally just had to use my artwork over time to, to cope. It was kind of a, a need and not having substances. I just had to find other things that work. So like, like music and art, um, those, are, those have been what I use. Um, and and then, you know, over time you see, oh, this is actually, this is useful for people. And that's validating and and cool. Is it, it lends purpose to my experience. So, yeah. yeah. So there's uh, another book called Earth Breaths, which is this one here. Yeah. And I noticed that in Earth Breaths and drawings you talked a lot about breath and breathing Mm -hmm. and you have a background in yoga so how do you think I mean did the background in yoga sort of inspire a lot of the um 
use of breathing and breaths in your book? Uh, oh yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I think, um, practicing a lot of breath, breath work, breath practices, uh, intentional breathing, um, you could say like pranayama, but you could just say intentional breathing, long, deep breathing. I mean, that's a real, for anyone who wants to get into that, like just look up breath work and just, it's rich. And the way I see it is, I mean, there are a lot of communities that focus on that and teach that, but your breath is not proprietary for anyone. <laughs> you know, it's not a, it's like, it's all in you and it's very personal. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The work in yoga and meditation, mindfulness, uh, that was my first link. And I connected with that early to mid twenties for the first time. Yeah. Just with having a background in that, I wonder if you could share, like, um, how do you feel like breath work and breathing can benefit people's mental health or even people like in a severe state? even uh yeah um i mean you can look at it as uh an anchor or a leash or something like that uh or a guide basically I i'm gonna like i'll try to plan like when i talk to kids because so many adults say this too sometimes with kids especially you know they're like well i'm breathing all the time like, so I'm already doing it. And it's like, well, true, but so, you know, our autonomic nervous system gets into certain rhythms and patterns. Those are, uh, those are influenced by stress. They could be experiential stress we've had in this life, or it could be intergenerational um, that nothing happened to us directly necessarily, but it's a stress that was carried on and kind of the part of the um, the emotional, chemical, hormonal bath that we grew up in, um, or just part of, you know, we know that stress and trauma alters DNA. So it could just be tucked away in there for us to deal with. Um, yeah. and, and however it arrives with us, it's not something that we're usually um, trying to deal with consciously, right? It's just we breathe and thank goodness we breathe. Most of us are able to breathe automatically, but because it's set a semi-automatic, we can tune in to, we, we can actually tune into taking deeper breaths, slower breaths. And for me, what a deep breath does and a slow deep breath does it is it says you're safe. Mm -hmm. says here I am I'm safe it tells your mind that so that means your thoughts are able to relax often over time sometimes pretty quickly sometimes it takes more time you know um it helps your body relax and it's just it's just like different messaging because you're kind of hacking into like the source of like what thoughts you're tuning into mm -hmm. um and it's, it's um, yeah, it can be very powerful. You can, you can really affect some really powerful change, even just, um, even just deciding in a moment, like catching, catching ourselves when our breath is, is like faster and shallower and just deciding I'm going to deepen this breath. And it's, it's not prescriptive in that. Um, I find like, as a suggestion, anyone who starts to work with their breath in this way, like no critical nature around it. You know, it's like, if you can deepen one breath, awesome. Congratulate yourself. Yeah. See if you can make the next one deeper, both on the inhale and the exhale. If you're in a safe place, you can sustain the inhale and like hold it a little bit or sustain the exhale. There's all sorts of ways to to work with our breath, but I, I find it really, really potent. Because um, if you're in, let's say, one of those, uh, I forget the name of the um, condition where you can't like stop moving. Oh, akathisia. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I don't, I'm, I don't know anything about it, so I don't want to say anything. Like I, I don't 
I don't know much about it, but I know, okay, if we're in any any state of calm, or, or sorry, any state of stress, yeah, and um, movement, like usually the breath helps, you know, and it's like, maybe the breath could help if you can't stop moving, maybe it can help you move slower. Because you are tapping into something very, very real with the breath. And you're also feeding your brain more oxygen. So you're able to like literally, this I'll explain to kids too, you're, you're feeding more of your brain oxygen that allows different parts of your brain and mind to function that might not otherwise. Um, yeah, very powerful stuff. I can, I can yeah. go on. Yeah. I think you're you're spot on. I mean, with you know, not knowing anything about akathisia, but saying that it could help. I mean, in in my withdrawal syndrome, learning uh, yin and restorative yoga. You know, nothing nothing crazy. None of these like poses that you had to hold and like you right. know all of that. Right. Just stretching and holding it, and then learning how to breathe, especially through my nose. For some reason, that type of breath for me, it was like one of the only tools that I found in withdrawal where I could give myself some comfort and sometimes even put myself to sleep because insomnia is a really big part of coming off of some of these medications. So mm. I thought all of the time, you know, when we were talking about like parents who don't necessarily give their kids tools for coping with life that we wish as adults, maybe we would have been taught and I yeah. thought all the time, like, ah, oh, if I just would have known about yoga or breathing before, I probably wouldn't have wound up on psychiatric medications if I hadn't known how to better, you know, self-regulate and how powerful these things so simple as breathing could be in calming and soothing oneself, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, and I think that's the power of what you're doing now, you know, it's like, because I, you know, often our parents, they didn't, they didn't know about it either. You know, it's not yeah. like they were like, let me not share this. Exactly. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, now I can like, actually, sometimes I can help my parents deep breathe. And yeah, there's something a lot of us are, I think right now that this, the times we're living are kind of kooky. And if you look at humanity and planet earth right now, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, there's been this petri dish of humans, you know, and they've been pretty much in the same place relatively for the past um, thousands of years. And maybe there's there's been some migration for sure. But it's usually slow and tempered. And then in the last uh, maybe 100, 150 years, it's like someone took that petri dish and started shaking it violently. And we're all over the place and we're disconnected from maybe some we don't really know um, what kind of cultural and social anchors we may have had that may have met some of our psychiatric needs in the past because it's just been all joggled up. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then like with social media and like, you know, there's great things about social media, like you mentioned before, but also like major downsides that I think, you know, contribute to people having a harder time these days. I'm glad when I look back that I didn't have it when I was growing up for sure, but you know. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's important. I think also I was thinking about earth, earth breaths and what I really wanted to communicate there was what came through is like really the conversation of mental health in our in ecology is usually too it's usually separate conversations, but mm -hmm. they're really not like, they're not, you know, like when you live in a city where you're just surrounded by concrete and you don't take intentional reprieve from that. And you think that we talk about our mental health without um, looking at that as a factor that millions of billions of people are experiencing every day then there's there's something that in the conversation of mental health is there is something that's really um it's like a planetary human cultural shift that is needed if we're really getting to the men like the bottom of mental health i think yeah i've i mean i've heard people say before like we're living in a sick society and then like treating people 
and their reactions to the sick society as if that's the sickness, but really the sickness is all around us, you know? Yeah. 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 And we're trying, we're doing our best to move, move through it and thrive yeah. as best we can. Yeah. In spite of it. Right. So you also have a book about grief called when their bodies leave them, which mm-hmm. I love. And then another really important one too, which when I read it, I was like, oh, I'm so glad you wrote a book about that called Locker Room Talk. Oh about, yeah. Uh, how men can speak and relate with one another in kindness and support coming from a culture of often toxic competitiveness. It's about healing toxic masculinity, which I think is such a huge, huge problem restoring the divine masculine and ultimately a picture of how men can better relate and benevolence and brotherhood. I love it. So I'm wondering now that we know sort of some of the other topics that you've written about grief, which the DSM has recently, I think, changed the timeline of which you can be diagnosed with a so-called mental disorder for having grief And Mm -hmm. lots of people, you know, wrote articles and stuff about that saying, like, I'm not sure when somebody you love or so important to you dies that you ever stop grieving or there's like some timeline. It just seems so absolutely silly to try to quantify it in that space or whatever. So that, I mean, such an important topic, grief. And then, you know, toxic masculinity too. I'm wondering, like, what other topics do you think in this space you would want to to write a book about that you haven't yet? Well, yeah, as, as we're sitting here, I have behind my computer uh, like a like a list. It's like thirty five books that are wow. in progress. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll run through a couple of them that are kind of yeah. Okay. There's, there are a lot of topics that come through. Um, one is about connecting with the animals. The, uh, I'm, that's the book I'm illustrating with someone and, and like kind of the um, spiritual and emotional power of animals. Uh, another one is about, um, this one's for younger kids, about using our hands and um, how we use our hands. I, I find that when I when I work in, with younger kids, there's often like one or two boys who just the go-to is like striking another kid every 20, 30 minutes, very reliably. And like, and usually the teachers are too overwhelmed to deal with it on a case by case basis. And so it gets ignored or they end up shaming the child and ultimately they not getting what they need. So like, what can we do with our hands? Um, well, let me interrupt you. I have an idea. (laughs) Every time I give a gift card to my niece, she always buys slime. And I'm like, this is what my $20. <laughs> so maybe we can use our hands to play with slime. That's oh, yeah. Like, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> okay. Uh, the kids, they love that that slime stuff, don't they? Oh, yeah. All the tactile. Yeah. And that's important, right? It's like the, it's, it's tactile. It brings them into their body and, yeah. and movement. Yeah. 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 Right. Oh, yeah. They'll probably make its way in. I'll, I'll okay. Let you know. Uh, yeah. And then there's a few. There's a. Uh, okay. I'm just looking at. It. I'm looking at. It. <laughs> like there's so many. Um. Because this is what I've really been called. Okay. There's one. A friend came up with the title of this, and then it inspired the book, book called "Don't Look Away," and that's really um about uh, an unhoused community. And um, people are living on the streets, which is also a national epidemic of, of lack of housing availability. Um, and there's the artist who I'm working with for that has been uh, without a home a lot of her life. She has an apartment now. So um, that's important. There's one called the Sticky Red Tape, which is for young kids, but it's about bureaucracy and the sticky red tape. That all these animals oh, yeah. have to go um so oh there's one called strong like a pansy and this is also like related to the masculinity because you know we're just flipping that around like uh Mm -hmm. 
strong like like you know people calling boys a pansy or men pansies if they're if they show some signs of gentleness and sensitivity it's like well it's actually strength you can take if you're able to listen and absorb someone's in a sincere way that's strong um yeah. and then oh there's one there's one more about um I don't know what the title will be, but it's about road rage and it's about these characters. I'm going to show you real quick. Okay, sure. So I think these are the characters. But I think about how how people walk around in traffic. Yeah. Sorry, traffic and it's very like disconnected from like personally, humanely disconnected, but we're all really these people with equally valid and interesting stories driving around in, in traffic. And uh, it's, it's really very weird to me because we're just in these boxes yeah. and we disconnect it, so. I think know. there's a term for that actually, like, well, not exactly what you're explaining, but like, there's a feeling. Have you ever been driving down the car, uh, down the road in your car and you just had a feeling like when you looked around that you're surrounded by all these people who have like all of these lives that you don't know anything about, but it, and there's a word yeah. for it. I'll have to look it up and oh, send you. I would be, if you find out, would you tell me? Cause I, I would be curious about that. Cause, yeah. cause I think that's something, it's like another thing we've had to numb ourselves out to, you know, it's just like, it's so much. Um, but I think, I think we would do well to take a look at like what yeah. is actually happening or we're, we're driving through thousands of people in traffic in Los Angeles so we, yeah. you know it's like it's a it's a lot so anyway those are some of the topics that wow uh, really good yeah. important stuff when you said what was the title of the one for people not having housing oh don't look away yeah okay I thought you were gonna say like maybe when like being with people who are suffering like our natural uh, inclination is to sort of not want to hear about that or not want to sit with people's um, shadow emotions, you know, we yeah. say like, oh, yeah. stop crying. Don't be angry mm -hmm. instead of encouraging, you know, those types of things because they're normal human things. So they're normal and they're important. And, yeah. and they're, they're really important guides for like what we want our world to look like. And if we're feeling certain things, there's a good chance that that maybe um, a different course of action is is in place, not not just trying to numb it out. So, yeah. yeah. Well, Oshri, I love what you do. I love your books. Um, I hope people watching today got something out of it and they'll go, uh, you know, look for your books and see all the topics that you're, uh, you have available already, and then also follow you so that we can keep up with all the ones that uh, are going to come out. So before we close, I guess, um, I want to give you a moment for any closing thoughts that you want to share and also to let people know where they can follow you and find you once we're um, done talking today. Um. Yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And this has been really fun, honestly, sharing. So thank you. Um, yeah. uh, well, I think I would just feel called if anyone listens to this, if you have a creative seed in you to not hold that back. And it might be like, yes, there are a lot of creators active right now, but there are also a lot of people who need help and assistance. And and you might, your unique strand of creativity, that might be what that might fit someone else's thing way more than what I could create, or way more than someone who's way more known and popular than than me. You know, there's like there's so um like the the work of your heart and spirit is needed somewhere so i, I would just love nudging people into honoring that and um and if it's helpful for you to put it out for yourself that's already tremendous value because we're all we're all so connected yeah um so i'll settle that and then uh you can I find me on 
Good yeah. answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I'm on, I'm pretty, uh, I post my daily art on Instagram. So I'm there. That's just my first name, last name together at first Oshri Hakak. And, um, and then I also post when I, you know, when I make new books and put them out. So that's a pretty easy way to find me. And then um, all the books are, uh, I used to not have them on Amazon in the last couple of months and like, just make them as accessible as possible. So they are on butterflyandbooks.com, but they're also on Amazon. You can search my name there. And it'll come up. Okay, awesome. And like I said, for anyone um, tuning in, we'll put the links below so you don't even have to go searching. You can just find them. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us for this live discussion. If you haven't seen the film Medicating Normal yet and you want to, go to our website at medic medicatingnormal.com slash watch for the many ways you can view it. Thanks again, Oshri, so much. I love what you do. I hope you'll keep doing it. And thanks everybody for tuning in and see you soon. And please keep in touch, Oshri. Yeah. Thank you. I will. I look forward okay. to it. Yeah. All right. Take care. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Right. Bye.